Hello everybody, my name is Uska Novákova um, and today I would like to tell you something about the technology called quantitative phase imaging, its basic principle and several applications. So starting from the beginning, uh, there is a trouble when you want to visualize cells because cells are phase objects. It means that in the world of uh, light transmitted light microscopy, the light changes its phase when it passes through the cells, not, not its amplitude. Therefore, these objects appear transparent. They are non-detectable for human eyes. And if you want to look at cells, you have to enhance the contrast somehow. Otherwise, you end up with such an image. So there are several techniques how um, contrast of the image can be enhanced. So for example, there are libel-free techniques like phase contrast or DIC. These te techniques are good for live cell imaging, but they are not quantitative. If you want to visualize cells quantitatively and use some specific labels, then there is a whole world of fluorescent microscopy. This allows you to visualize specific, specifically, but there is always some price for this. Uh, for example, using fluorescent labels uh, can interfere with the results of your experiments. The labels may photo bleach. Uh, in some cases, you have to use uh, lasers, which can induce some phototoxicity to your samples. So there is always some pros and cons. Uh, but what if we use the phase of the light for the cell visualization? And I'm not talking about phase contrast methods, but what if you would like to do it quantitatively and end it up with such a nice image without using any labels? That would be nice. And that's the technique called quantitative phase imaging. In principle, what you have to do in this technology is to split the beam uh, that comes from the light source in your microscope into two arms. One arm is called the object arm. The second one is called the reference arm. You already know what happens, uh, what happens in the object arm. The light that passes through the cell is slightly delayed. So there is a phase shift. The phase of the light is changed by the sample. Uh, in the reference arm, you place just a reference sample to compensate for some effects, but that there is no phase shift. And then you bring these two beams back together and let them interfere. So at the camera plane, at the detector, you actually detect hologram. The interference pattern that you see in the image that consists of the interference fringes. But this would be quite strange to look at cells using holograms. So from holograms, because the holograms store uh, complete information about the transmitted light, you can easily reprocess the face image. This is a nice way how to look for the cells. So this is an example when you do this for the whole cell population. So on the left, there is a hologram of cell population. And on the right, there is a face image reprocessed from such a hologram. And when I zoom in into such image, you can actually see that there is a cell on the right but interference fringes on the left. But what makes this technology beautiful is that it's quantitative. It means that each pixel of the face image carries the information about the radiance, about the phase shift, how much was the light delay when passing through the cells. So this is a quantitative phase imaging, the process of detecting the quantitative length of the phase of the transmitted light. And if we take it even one step further, from the detected phase, we can actually quantify the cell dry mass. Uh, because higher the optical density of the object, the higher the phase shift. And that there is a direct relationship between the uh, cell dry mass and the phase shift. So uh, basically cell dry mass, you can imagine as the content of lipids, proteins, nucleic acid in cells. And higher the contact of these molecules inside the cells, higher the refractive index of such material and higher the phase shift. So using another uh, reprocess step, we can easily get the image that has a scale not in radians, but a scale in, in picograms per micrometer square. Uh, why is it good to set a cell dry mass? So cell dry mass, you can imagine as biomass, the mass of everything that makes up the, the cell content other than water. Um, and the cell dry mass serves in many aspects as a sensitive parameter for cell integrity, for cell growth, cell metabolism. And in QPI technology, you can combine 
getting the imaging data because it's a microscopic imaging technique. So you get the imaging data on your cells. And for each cell, you get also the information of cell dry mass distribution. And if you did a time lapse study, you get also this information in time. So QPR actually allows you to perform non-invasive monitoring of different cellular processes. You can study cell proliferation, growth, cytotoxicity, cell cycle, different types of cell death. All these processes are reflected in the changes of cell dry mass. And what's important here, that you get this information label free without any need to handle your cells, to change their genome, to stain them with first labels. It's a label free approach. And QPR is a great technique, highly relevant for the cell biology research and pharmaceutical research because it allows you, as I said, to study cell dry mass non-invasively. And I'm sure that uh, Dr. Balban will tell you more in the following talk. But let me stop uh, for a while also uh, the QPI data. Uh, so there is something more about this image. And that's that the background of such image is really flat. As you can see from the lines that uh, uh, display the profile of such image compared to the phase contrast method that suffers from the white halo artifacts around cells, the background, of QP, the background in the QPI image is really flat. And therefore, these data are great for the image analysis because you can easily not only discriminate the background and objects, but also easily segment the objects. And QPI data are of uniform quality because they come from the intrinsic property of the cells, from the refractive index, from the cell dry mass. So they will give you the uniform quality over time. They are not depending on the intensity that you used for the illumination during the experiment, or they are not depending on the concentration of the label that you used. You always get the same uh, quality throughout the experiments. And therefore, they represent a reliable source for the advanced image analysis. And I highly recommend this nice review, how the quantitative phase imaging data are suitable for the AI, for the advanced image analysis. So if you are into this topic, check this review. So I already mentioned that with QPI, you easily get the cell dry mass. But if you segment the objects, you can also easily quantify other morphological parameters like cell area, density, so parameter. You can also, in terms of time lapse experiments, you can also uh, easily describe the cell motility using different parameters. Then you get this nice morphology and, and motility data together. And many of the QPI microscopes that are available nowadays on the market already come with the nice uh, analytical softwares that allows you to view the data separately or view the population data uh, separately for each cell. Then you can play with the dot plots and do some population gatings, which may resemble you flow cytometry, but this is all based on the imaging data, on the QPI data, which are label free. The application areas of the QPI technology are almost unlimited. Uh, this technology works with any type of cells. Uh, you are not limited by some certain cell type, so you can study different uh, types of cell, uh, cancer cells, stem cells, immune cells, as you can see from the images and videos. Uh, this technology, since the cell dry mass is a sensitive parameter of cell viability and cell health in general, so this technology is good for to be applied in pharmacology research. Um, and also it has a great potential if you combine the QPI with other techniques. For example, uh, it can be easily combined with the fluorescent imaging, so you can still get the nice QPI data and then visualize some specific label structures inside your cells or specific processes. Uh, if you combine it with holography, um, tomography, sorry, with the tomographic approach, then you get the 3D data, so you can also do the QPI in 3D. Um, if you combine it with the flow systems, then you can measure, for example, the mechanical properties of and the refractive index of the cell membrane and how it's affected by the flow. You can also use it not only for animal or human cells, but also on plant cells. Um, and there's also 
big part of the application area that deals with measuring the refractive index of uh, biomaterials and biomolecular condensates, but Patrick will tell you more in his talk later. So with that, I would like to summarize the main advantages of PPI technology. So first of all, it's a labor-free technique. It allows you to visualize cells without the need to stain them, to handle them. Uh, so there is no toxicity coming from the labels. It's a non-invasive and non-disturbing technique. Secondly, it's quantitative. It gives you quantitative data on cell dry mass. It's of low phototoxicity and there is no photo bleaching, obviously, if, because we are not using any labels. So it's highly suitable for long-term observations of live cells. Uh, there are different approaches how QPI data can be obtained. Some of the techniques are even single shot imaging techniques, meaning that you get one hologram, one QPI already, and one image with all the data there. Uh, these data are of high contrast, and you know the better the imaging data, better the segmentation, and better the segmentation, better the following downstream analysis of the data. You can analyze the data at the level of the population but also you can check every cell in such an image and this technology because of this uh, background this technology is highly compatible with the artificial intelligence uh, image analysis this graph i made uh, one month ago and it shows that the number of creepy application is rising but because we would like to have it even higher so uh, we decided to have this webinar to promote this technology. And as you may see, uh, the application areas are really wide. So if you have any ideas or any questions, do not hesitate to contact us. And this is all from my side. Susanna, that was great. Um, so the, we're open now to questions. Maybe I can start with the first uh, more general question. So you really nicely summarized all the advantages of QPI, but I wonder, wonder if we can a little bit elaborate on the challenges, like what do researchers really need to um, consider? For example, I would imagine you need quite stable conditions when you run these experiments. So if you can maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, of course, there are also some maybe disadvantages. Uh, for example, I show you in the beginning that the microscope uh, has two optical arms. This inc may increase the cost of the microscope and also you have to ensure the, the stability of the system to get the interference of these two beams that you split in the beginning. Uh, but there are some ways how to make the system stable and how to adjust it even during the long time uh, experiments. When you do the multi-position time lapses, there are some adjustment procedures that uh, microscope can do automatically, but you have to be aware of this, of course. And I also mentioned that there are several QPI microscopes on the market already. Uh, I don't want to discuss all of them. Some of them have a simpler setup and therefore they can deal better with these challenges, but there's always some pros and cons. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so with that, we'll go to the next speaker, um, Patrick. Um, so yeah, thanks again, Susanna. So just to uh, yeah, briefly introduce uh, Patrick. So he is uh, currently an Albert Paul. So um, he received his PhD in physics from the University of Chicago, where he worked with Margaret Gardel using actin as a model system to explore the interplay between molecular scale dynamics and organelle scale functionality. And he is now an Albert Paul at the Max Planck Institute of Cell Biology and Genetics and Max Planck Institute for Physics of Complex Systems and the lab of Jean, Jean Bruges and Tony Hyman. And he'll talk about how we can use quantitative phase microscopy to determine the composition of biomolecular condensates. So um, yeah, thanks, Patrick. We're looking forward to your talk. Thanks so much for the kind introduction and uh, the invitation to speak. Um, I am very, very fortunate in the sense that um, uh, I completely chanced into using quantitative phase microscopy. Um, we had a, a generation one system uh, from then Tescan, uh, sitting in our light microscopy facility and a little bit underutilized. Um, and it became very clear for the project that I wanted to work on that this was really the, the perfect instrument for the kind of measurement that we uh, found to be necessary uh, to answer the questions that we were interested in. So to get into what that is, what the questions that I care about are, um, uh, as uh, Matt mentioned, I'm uh, going to talk about composition determination of biomolecular condensates with uh, quantitative phase microscopy. And um, 
over the last decade or so, um, there, there are these internal structures that are common to many, many different cells um, that have been termed, become termed biomolecular condensates. And many of them have been around for a long time. We've known that they've existed uh, for decades often. Um, but what's changed recently is the recognition that we can describe their formation and some of their material properties by thinking of them as um, being demixed phases rather than solid-like aggregates. And so this is, these are now classic examples um, taken from the early uh, C. elegans embryo. Uh, and so on the left, we're looking at um, what are called P granules. And these are germ granules. Um, and it's important that they get segregated before the first cell division because they specify uh, the fate of the germline. And so the cell on the, what will become the cell on the right-hand side here uh, is enriched in these P granules that were initially distributed everywhere. Um, these had been observed for decades again, and uh, we knew a lot about them, but what we didn't realize until 2009 was that uh, they behave like liquids. As the name granule suggested, they were thought to be solid uh, assemblies, but actually under shear stress, they deform and flow and drip and merge and fuse very, very much like liquids. And so this prompted a rethinking of the physical basis for their formation. And now uh, it's been quite established uh, in this context and also in others, that it's much like uh, oil drops in water, pea granules are liquid-like phases that have demixed from the cytoplasm. And so in the intervening 13 years now, um, there have been many, many examples that have been identified in different cellular contexts and different de developmental contexts, and they're associated with a large array of functions. Um, these could be environmental sensing or activation of certain processes, force generation filtering. Um, what for me as a physicist and a biological physicist, I find particularly interesting about this is thinking about how the material properties of the condensates can actually inform these functions and help uh, control them. And so a simple one to think about is maybe the reaction rate. Imagine you have an enzyme that uh, binds to a substrate and also ATP. And this enzyme, let's say, is a kinase, and so it phosphorylates your substrate. This is the reaction that's taking place. Uh, for first order reaction kinetics, we'd expect that the rate of the reaction might be proportional to the enzyme concentration and the substrate, substrate concentration. More properly, we'd talk about an activity, but we're not going to get into that too much today. Um, but uh, yes, this is sort of how you would model the rate. That reaction, that rate constant out in front is typically a, a function of the diffusion coefficients for these molecules. They diffuse more fast, more quickly than they will run into each other more frequently and you'll have a faster reaction rate. But the diffusion coefficient we know is also a function of uh, the temperature, the size of the objects and the viscosity of the environment. So if you're imagining a reaction taking place in a compartment, if you change the viscosity of the environment by a factor of two or a factor of 10, you'd also change then the diffusion coefficients by corresponding factors of two and 10, and thus potentially also the rate by a significant amount. So the reaction rate, for instance, could depend very, very strongly on the mechanical properties of these droplets, which in principle could be tuned. These can also be useful for force generation. Um, I won't dwell on this too much, but if um, a droplet condenses either in the cytoplasm or on a surface, it has an interfacial tension. And this tension can be used to deform surfaces as we have shown in the membrane case over here on the right, but it can also be used uh, to condense uh, DNA as is shown schematically here uh, from work from the Bruges lab. The point that I want to make here is that the physical properties of these droplets can confer biological function. And so it's important then to understand where those physical properties come from, how they're determined, whether or not they're evolutionarily selected for, which I think is a fascinating question. And all this means that we actually have to understand uh, the composition of these droplets, because as with any material from everyday experience, what it can do and the properties that it has physically are determined by the composition, by what it's made of. And so the working hypothesis that drives my work is that the composition of these structures informs their physical properties, which informs their biological function. By composition, I mean which molecules are present and how much. How much is what we're really gonna focus on today. Physical properties are, are lots of examples that could be relevant. Viscosity I've talked about, and facial tension I've talked about. The overall shape of the phase diagram in general could be relevant and the types of biological functions cells could use these for and have been shown in some cases to use them for are include regulation of reactions, generation of force, and sensing of the environment. So to think about composition a little bit more concretely, um, the, we should imagine a, a phase diagram. And I know this might not be a familiar territory <laughs> for everyone, so I'm going to go through this pretty slowly. But imagine I've got um, a test tube that has exactly two types of molecules. There's a solvent, let's say water, 
and there's a protein, a polymer. And we're going to say the concentration of that polymer or this protein is C1. And I'm at some temperature in my room. And so I've got this point on uh, my phase diagram and the concentration and temperature plane. And I could look under a microscope at this sample. And here it would look homogeneous. I wouldn't see any sort of structure. This is just a single phase. If at a higher concentration, I take the sample, now look at it under the microscope and I see structures, see droplets that can fuse with one another and get larger. This looks like a demixed system where I now have two different phases. This tells me that preparing a system with these two molecules at this concentration and this temperature is thermodynamically unstable. And so what actually happens is that the system demixes, this concentration is, is not present in the system anymore, even though it's the average over the whole volume. And what you have instead is a dilute phase in uh, light red and a dense phase coexisting in time. And if we then sweep through temperature, we can actually find uh, a collection of points that make what we call the binodal. And the binodal is, is just this thick line on the outside. And it's the boundary between the one phase regime where we don't have phase separation and the two phase regime where we do. The binodal, there's a lot of information in the binodal. Um, in particular, the dilute branch tells us about how condensates can be regulated. If I prepare the system here, for instance, then I don't have phase separation, but at the same expression level, same protein concentration, if you then decrease the temperature, suddenly you demix, um, for instance. The condensed branch also tells us a lot of important information. In particular, it tells us about the condensate properties. It tells us the actual amount of material inside. And any physical property uh, that the droplet might have, its viscosity, its interfacial tension is going to depend on the absolute concentration of protein inside. If you have a very, very dense droplet, you might expect that it would be more viscous than uh, less, a more dilute droplet made with the same protein. And so for my question, I would really like to understand um, this value. I'd like to understand where it comes from. And when I started my postdoc, um, uh, talented group member in Tony Hyman's lab, Jia Wang, had purified uh, all the members of a large protein family of RNA binding proteins. And so these have some well-known members, including um, fusin sarcoma and EWSR1, both of which um, are associated with cancers in some cases. Um, and they, have, they share a similar protein domain structure where they have um, prion-like low complexity sequences and also folded RNA binding domains. And so all of the members of this family we found um, partition droplets or phase separates readily themselves. And what GA did was he correlated the concentration at which they phase separate, their saturation concentration, so the left-hand branch of the phase diagram I showed on the slide before, with their sequence composition, in particular looking at the number of tyrosine residues and the number of um, arginine residues. And what he found was a very, very strong correlation, where the more of each of these residues you had, the lower the protein concentration at which you start to demix. So in other words, the wider your binodal becomes. And this was really exciting. It suggested that it might be possible to actually predict why some proteins phase separate at very low concentrations, some of this phase separate at very high concentrations only, and that we might be able to bring some, some order to the seeming chaos of, oh, this protein phase separates, but this one doesn't, and this one does, and this one doesn't. So it was very exciting for this reason. But this was only part of the story. This was only looking, telling us about the saturation concentration. And so I was really keen to know what the condensed phase concentration would be. And so we wanted to try to measure this. The problem was that this was actually, for a very technical reason, very problematic. And if you look at um, a bright field image of a bunch of droplets, you see that the field of view is covered with droplets. So it seems like we might have a lot of droplet material. But what we're forgetting is that the 100 microliters of solution above the cover glass is completely devoid of condensed phase. And so actually the typical volume fraction of the uh, sample volume that is made up of droplets is incredibly tiny. It's less than a tenth of a percent. And this means that traditional techniques to measure the composition of material which require large samples are not going to be practical, particularly not with uh, recombinantly expressed proteins um, that you can't just easily denature or that you need to express in um, expression systems like insect cells where you can get post-translation modifications that aren't present in bacteria. So for a lot of technical reasons, existing techniques were really problematic. There are a couple of notable examples where people really tried really hard and looked at um, just a, a portion of a protein 
and we're able to get uh, phase diagrams and do measurements. But in general, it's just not practical for high throughput measurements. We want to look at a lot of different protein sequences. And so we we're looking for a technique where we could do um, an in situ measurement looking at droplets, um, micron sized objects. We wanted to, so this needed to be some kind of microscopy. It had to be label free because the, whether or not a protein phase separates or when it phase separates is set by the balance of attractive interactions between the protein and itself and the protein and solvent. And if you stick a 25 kilojoulton GFP molecule that's highly solvated onto the end of this, that completely changes the balance of those interactions. And so we really wanted to steer away from uh, using fluorescent labels. Of course, we wanted it to be accurate and precise. And so what we came upon then was quantitative phase microscopy. Um, I'm going to not talk about how the microscope works because Susanna did an excellent job of introducing that uh, in the previous talk. But I will note that the whole reason we can see these droplets in this bright field image is because there's a difference in refractive index between the dilute phase outside and the condensed phase on the inside. And what's really convenient for our purposes is that the refractive index of a protein solution is actually linear in protein concentration. This has been known since the 50s. What this means is that if I can measure the refractive index of my solution, then I know what protein concentration I would have to have to give rise to that refractive index difference. And so mathematically, you can write that down as dn, the refractive index difference is proportional to the concentration of the condensed phase. And for the proteins that I'll be talking about today, the residual amount of protein in the dilute phase is so small that that term we can neglect here, which is why I say this is approximate. Now, the way to think about what's happening here in uh, quantitative phase imaging is imagine that we have uh, micron-sized droplets that, have, that are in contact with a planar substrate, piece of glass or passivated glass. We've got uh, phase fronts coming in from above along the imaging axis. As those phase fronts traverse the high refractive index droplets, there's a phase shift. It, the phase front is delayed. And on the detector, what we'll get, of course, is an interference image. But after processing, what we get is a phase image where the phase shift as a function of space um, has been retained quantitatively. And there's a relationship then between that phase shift that we measure in the image with the refractive index of the object and its projected height. Conveniently, for droplets, particularly in vitro, where you're using purified components, when they interact with a cover glass, the density differences and the interfacial tension are in the range such that for droplets much less than about um, 30 microns in radius, uh, their shape is excellently described uh, as that of a sphere that's been truncated by the cover glass, which means that we can actually take quantitative phase images in principle and fit them uh, to a model of what their shape ought to be and then extract the refractive index difference by itself. And so this is what we tried to do. Um, we used a model system to start with just to calibrate the technique um, where we took two polymers, uh, polyethylene glycol and dextran. If you mix them at high concentrations, then they demix from one another. You end up with uh, a pegrich phase at the top. You know what, I'm gonna change this to a laser pointer. Hopefully you can see this a little bit better. A pegrich phase at the top and a dextran rich phase at the bottom. If you then take, let's just equilibrate, take a little bit of the dextran rich phase um, and add it to a tube containing pegrich phase, what you end up with are dextran rich droplets that have equilibrated with the pegrich phase outside. And on a quantitative phase microscope, um, they then, your phase images then look like this. So if we select one of these droplets, we have the quantitative phase image itself. We see that it's very bright on the inside of the droplet because the droplet is taller there and then it decays to the outside. If we then fit this image to a model of the, uh, that has four geometric parameters, three for the centroid of the droplet and X, Y, and Z, and then a fourth for the radius, then we get an excellent um, model for the geometry. And then the only free parameter left is the refractive index difference itself. We can see that from the residuals, we actually have a flat interior. There is a residual, a systematic residual at the exterior, but this we think comes from a lensing artifact. And it turns out that um, in the case of these peg dextran droplets, these model droplets, but also glass spheres um, embedded in a glycerol water mixture where we can then tune the refractive index difference, we don't see any systematic size dependence at all. And so we're getting able, we're able in each case to get um, a very consistent and precise measure of the refractive index. And what's really nice is that we were able to show that the refractive index difference that we measure experimentally with the quantitative phase images is an excellent agreement with what we could get from a refractometer. 
Now with a refractometer, you need hundreds of microliters of material. And so for protein droplets, that was out of the question. Um, but for PEG and dextran, you can see from this tube, you can get hundreds of microliters, no problem. And so it's one of the few samples where we could actually quantitatively check uh, that we're getting the right answer effectively from our fitting. But we see that we do, which is exciting. Um, and importantly, we see that we actually get linearity over a really broad range of refractive index differences, which is good because this is actually the range of differences that we see for protein droplets. Moving then to protein droplets, um, we looked at the RNA binding domain of a protein regulation. And uh, we measured the concentration inside this to be just shy of 400 milligrams per milliliter, which is on the low end of protein crystal concentrations. And it's a volume fraction of about 30%. So it's very, very dense. This means that it's only about 70% water, which is very, very different from cytoplasm, which is more like 90% water um, and very different from the dilute phase around it. Somewhat depending on who you talk to, surprisingly or not, we find that we get very different numbers if we try to measure this with fluorescence, which is the most commonly think, done thing in the field. The idea would be you dope in a small amount of fluorescently labeled construct into your droplet, and you look at the ratio of fluorescence intensities inside the droplet versus outside. And depending on how carefully you do this, you get different numbers, but trying to be quite careful with a um, point scanning confocal microscope and avoiding all pixels within a micron and a half of the edge, to avoid pinhole crosstalk or um, the, the finite nature of the point spread function, uh, you can get a partition co coefficient of say a thousand, um, but it's still actually only a third <laughs> of what we find with quantitative phase microscopy. More problematically, we find that if we use a different fluorophore uh, here at GFP, instead of um, uh, an Alexa floor, we get then a totally different number. And we've done some systematics here and it's very, very difficult to calibrate the system in a way that you can really trust the fluorescence intensity that you get inside of a droplet um, relative to what you might calibrate in dilute solution. Um, and given the fact that this, the, the presence of the dye can also influence their interactions that's described that determine the phase behavior in the first place, we're much happier using a label-free technique like quantitative phase microscopy to get um, an answer that we think is a bit more reliable. So I mentioned this was uh, for the RNA binding domain of protein TAF15. Uh, there are other members of this family that I introduced earlier. In particular, we're looking at uh, FUS and TDP43. And we measured using uh, QPI, the concentration of protein inside of these droplets. And what we saw, interestingly, was that this was a linear function of the uh, fraction of tyrosine residues and fraction of arginine residues. So this is consistent with the work that came out of Tony Hyman's lab earlier, that these uh, two residue classes uh, can interact with one another and can drive demixing, drive phase separation of these proteins. And so we thought this was pretty exciting. And it suggests then that we might be able to not only tune the saturation concentration, but also tune, tune the composition of these droplets by changing the, the sequence contents. And then if we look at um, structural predictions from alpha fold two, we see that a large fraction, though not all, of these proteins uh, include intrinsically disordered regions that of course don't adopt a, a stable tertiary conformation. And many of these residues are localized um, to those disordered regions, though not entirely. Interestingly, um, this relationship does not hold for all RNA binding proteins. If we now look at uh, a different set of RNA binding proteins, including um, the N-terminal domain of uh, DDX4, a dead box helicase, or uh, the nucleocapsid protein from the coronavirus, or one of the components of the mediator complex involved in transcriptional regulation, or PGL3, the protein from uh, C. elegans, P. granules that I showed on the first slide. All of these also demix in solution in vitro, but have uh, much lower concentrations, and they do not follow this curve. What this suggests to us is that uh, you might have different molecular grammars, different um, regions of protein sequence space that where the rules are slightly different. And this could vary from family to family, how things interact and which uh, residues are most important. And in the context of these other proteins, a tyrosine and arginine may not be the dominant factors. And so this is a, an area for further research uh, in Tony's group uh, going forward. I want to, before I finish, mention one thing um, that came up uh, in the question to Susanna about stability. Uh, the Q we have a generation two um, Q phase uh, here in Dresden, 
and it's in a thermal isolation chamber, which means that we have very, very stable holographic alignment over the course of days. And so what that's allowed us to do is to look at the dynamics of these droplets over time on a very long time scale. And what I'm showing you right now is the amplitude image of a PGL3 droplet over the course of almost a day. And what we saw um, was that these droplets initially were very large and then they shrank. And the initial uh, thought that we had for why this might be was that um, you could have a process called Oswalt ripening, where um, material from small droplets preferentially goes to material, uh, gets moved towards larger droplets. But because we could, and if you're doing this imaging in bright field, that's all you'd be able to say. But with QPI, what we could actually see was that even though the droplets were getting smaller, the phase was increasing. And that's, that can't be, that's surprising because you would expect that if the droplet um, was, had the same material and it was just getting smaller, the height's going down, you wouldn't think the refractive index is changing, so you'd expect the phase to go down. But because it went the other direction, we knew that the concentration inside the droplets was actually increasing with time. So here I've overlaid 25 different droplets um, from different fields of view during this time course. And we see that they're all in lockstep change with this increase in protein concentration over a factor of two. And uh, interestingly, we saw that depending on the volume of these droplets, the dynamics were a little bit different um, where larger droplets uh, would shrink a little bit slower than, fast, than smaller droplets. Um, and that the fraction of molecules decreased, but not by too much, um, typically by less than half. Um, meaning that most of the, the protein material was remaining intact. It's just that the, the matrix was shrinking. And so water, in effect, was being expelled out. And this is particularly interesting because previous work um, from Dresden and elsewhere has shown that um, over time, purified droplets tend to harden. Their material properties um, in change with time. In particular, they get more viscous. The viscosity increases or they sometimes become uh, more gel-like. And this is completely consistent with what we see here, actually. So this is an example of um, microbiology data, basically looking at the diffusion of particles inside of droplets. It's taken by a colleague, uh, Louise Jaworth, while she was still here in Dresden. And the diffusion coefficient, in this case, at early time points was very high, but then as time passes, uh, the probe can diffuse less and less readily, um, consistent with an increase in viscosity. And from decades of polymer physics work, we know that as you increase the concentration of a polymer in a solution, the viscosity increases sharply. So all this is consistent with the idea that uh, these time-dependent mechanical changes that have been seen previously could very well result um, almost entirely from the time-dependent change in the density of the droplets, which is something that makes a lot of physical sense, but we had no access to prior to doing quantitative phase microscopy and actually being able to measure the density directly. So with that, I want to um, wrap up and remind you sort of what I've talked about. Uh, in particular, uh, I've talked about how biomolecular condensates are a class of subcellular structure that are involved in a large number of processes and that uh, their composition plays an essential role in determining the physical properties that underlie their functionality in cells. Quantitative phase microscopy allows us to precisely measure their composition without recourse to labels, which it turns out can be rather confounding. Um, and we found so far that uh, by tuning the sequence composition of um, of proteins that demix, in particular RNA binding proteins, we can actually vary the density over a pretty wide range from 6% uh, protein to 30%, which is on the lower end of protein crystals, which gives us then a very um, clear physical picture of what these objects actually are. And we've also seen that agent dude's density changes uh, likely drive the time dependent viscosity that's been seen before. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and also point out a few uh, lab mates that helped. Um, the TDP43 work was in collaboration with Andy Yan. Uh, and the N protein work was done, was purified and done with uh, David Kuster, uh, a graduate student here in Dresden. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Patrick. That was amazing. Um, maybe while we wait for questions, I have a yeah, kind of, kind of a, again, a general question of, you showed those really beautiful images in your introduction of the worm pre-granules. Um, I was just wondering whether you think it'll be possible to, with, with QPI, measure concentrations like in vivo uh, in the worm, or, or is that something yes, you know, that will be pos possible in the future? Yeah, I, so it's a, it's a natural question and we would really like to. I think a challenge for in vivo measurements um, is you need refractive index contrast between the two phases. 
um, and Jochen Guck um, at uh, the MPI for the Physics of Light in, um, in Erlangen has done um, some pretty careful work uh, looking at a couple of different uh, compartments where you can tell by fluorescence where it is in the cell. And actually, we don't always see um, refractive index contrast. So the density of the droplet is then very, very similar to the density of the cytoplasm. It's just that the molecular identity, which molecules are where that has changed, but the overall density hasn't. And in that case, it's, it's difficult to conceive of how QPI would be particularly informative. Um, but then there are other cases like the nucleolus, right, where you have a very clear refractive index difference. Um, and there, this would be more helpful. I think um, tomographic techniques are going to be really important for in-cell work, in particular because the approach that I've used here relies very heavily on knowing a priori what the shape of the object is, so we can fit that quantitatively. Um, but things are not always perfect spheres <laughs> in cells, and so um, I think being able to measure it tomographically is then a, a crucial step there. Oh, cool. I don't see any question in the chat now, but uh, I'll just maybe ask one, one more question. I, I liked how you were comparing the, you know, the fluorescent based techniques to measure concentration with the QPI and there's a big, you know, difference. Um, maybe I missed it, but did you also look at, if you're like a fluorescently labeled, um, you know, cell, but don't actually use fluorescence and measure it by QPI, what would be the difference there, like compared to a, like a non-label? So I'm just wondering, as, as you mentioned, that the fluorescent label can also interfere with the dynamics you know, of proteins? Um, yes. Um, there's, so I haven't done the in-cell work myself, uh, but colleagues here have. And uh, in cells, it seems like maybe it's a bit more reliable. I think in vitro, um, there's a large issue is likely um, fluorescence quenching, that the photophysical environment, that the chemical environment inside the droplet because it's only maybe 70% water is very, very different than the buffer, which is 99.999% water. Um, and then there's differences in quenching and it's difficult to account for. But in cells, as I was mentioning before, the actual density difference between the droplets and the cytoplasm is maybe not so different. And so then if you can calibrate the fluorophore, your calibration is probably good in both or reasonably good in both phases and then a bit more reliable. A separate question is whether or not having the tag there changes the propensity to phase separate, if it changes the way that it interacts with the environment. And this we've definitely seen evidence for. Um, there are proteins where if you add a tag, you suppress phase separation. There's proteins where if you add a tag, you increase the propensity for phase separation. And so it's something that at the moment requires a, a fair amount of control work to be able to disentangle. Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I think we'll move on to the, our last speaker, um, Jan. Oh. Yeah, so our la last speaker is Jan Balvan, who is an assistant professor at Masaryk University, and has worked before on different things like also multimodal holographic microscopy. And he'll talk now about um, quantitative phase dynamics of cell death and how we can measure QPI, uh, how, how we can use QPI combined with deep learning to distinguish different cell types based on morphological features. So, um, Jan, the stage is yours. Thank you, mate, for a nice introduction. I will, as you will say, thanks to Delight and uh, Focal Plane for the opportunity to share some of my results with you. So, what is cell death? Cell death is plays an uh, essential role in many aspects of life. It is connected with the development of multicellular organisms with tissue homeostasis where cell death can, uh, can replace or replace dispensable cells, unwanted cells, or transformed cells. Cell death is also critical for fighting of infections, is associated with, with multiple diseases uh, that are caused by the deregulated or dysfunctional cell death signaling or this, this, this deregulated pathways. We can basically distinguish two types of cell death. During lytic cell death, the plasma membrane ruptures, releasing the cellular content, including some associated molecular patterns into the extracellular environment. Uh, these uh, damps are sensed by neighboring cells and the release of the cellular content can lead to the activation of immune cells or can lead to, leads to the activation of uh, the immune response. During apoptosis, a non-lytic type of cell that the cell disintegrates into the apoptotic bodies, which are still engulfed by intact plasma membranes. So the cell that occurs hidden from the immune system usually without an immune response and without the activation of immune system. 
uh, individual sorry individual types of cell death are associated with typical biochemical processes which change the which, which change the morphological or, or biophysical properties of dying cells also the cell processes the biochemical cell processes are reflected in the changes of the dynamics in the liquid liquid phase interface and that's the reason why we choose the quantitative phase imaging because it is ideal tool for studying uh, those uh, liquid liquid phase interactions and dynamics i've prepared two records showing the typical morphology here you can see apoptosis you can see that the dynamics of the cell content it's quite high uh, there is a shrinkage of the cell there's a highly dynamic movement inside the cytoplasm and it ends uh, by the so-called dance of death when the cell is disintegrated into apoptotic bodies so you can say or you can see that the apoptosis it's quite dynamic process uh, here these uh, records are obtained by quantitative phase imaging in the case of lytic cell death or maybe we can say necrosis, uh, you can see that the uh, lytic cell that it's uh, more boring than apoptosis. The movement of the cytoplasmic content, it's uh, lower, the dynamics is lower. You can see that those cells are swelling, the nuclei are swelling. There are many pathways leading to uh, the four pore formation inside the plasma, plasma membrane. And uh, there's increasing osmotic stress inside the cell which leads to the final cataclysmic events, uh, the rupture of the plasma membrane and the release uh, of the content. We can wait, yeah, we can see how the cells are releasing its content, how they are rupturing here. Okay, uh, taking, taking it together or sum it up, uh, we can say that all processes of cell death are connected with uh, changes in cell mass. For example, during, during uh, lytic cell death, there is a rupture of the plasma membrane. During apoptosis, there is the disintegration into the apoptotic bodies. During uh, entosis or cannibalism, there is uh, engulfment by neighboring cells or by phagocytes. All of these processes are connected with, with the cell mass changes. So my initial hypothesis was like, well, when, when we can measure the cell mass during time, we can use it for the detection of cell death because the cell mass will be changing in the time. And maybe we can even use it for the distinction between a lytic and apoptotic cell death because these curves can be specific for these types of cell death. So in the first experiment, I just recorded uh, the dying cells during the 24 hours. I, I, because in the beginning of the experiment here, all cells were alive so i was able to set up some threshold of living cells it was uh, something more than 200 200 picograms and i was quite happy because i can see the curves describing the cell mass they were falling below the threshold and and they were marking the dying cells and also the time of the cell death in the next step i selected two cells one typical apoptotic cell, which is on the left, and one typical lytic cell, which is des described on the, on the right. You can see how the changes differ in these two cells. Cell mass, area, circularity. You can see that during apoptosis, there is still some increase in the cell mass, proving that the cell is still metabolically active until this spiky section describes the, the blebbing of the membrane and the dance of death. Subsequently, uh, the apoptotic bodies fuse in the medium. And because we are in vitro and there are no professional phagocytes, the process of apoptosis ends by post-apoptotic or secondary necrosis. In the case of lytic cell death, uh, there is some breakpoint. Since then, the cell starts to decrease in the cell mass and increase in the area. So we can say that the cell is swelling until the final event of the plasma membrane rupture and massive release of the cell mass into the extracellular space. But unfortunately, the heterogeneity of uh, those curves for apoptosis and necrosis uh, was too high and makes the distinction of uh, cell death, uh, cell death impossible. So when I found that uh, 
the data provided by the microscope are insufficient, insufficient for the distinction. I had to talk to bioinformatician and it was uh, Tomasz Vichar, uh, <laughs> true hero in my short story because he extracted all the features from the data set and found that two of them uh, are able, that, that two of them could be used to distinguish uh, between lytic cell death and apoptosis uh, quite accurately. Those two features were density or we can say amount of mass per area or amount of mass per segmented mask of the cell and the uh, intensity change or Euclidean distance, which we can describe as a change of, uh, describe as change of pixel intensity under the mask of segmented cell mm, in two subsequent uh, frames or two subsequent micrographs. So based on the morphological and di dynamical parameters in time, we were able to automatically distinguish two population of cell one dying by lytic cell death and one dying by apoptotic cell. Uh, motivated by this success, we decided to perform the experiment more robust. We selected two, uh, three morphologically distinct cell lines. We used three that inducers, uh, for example, stavrosporin, which is a potent protein kinase C inhibitor, and it affects the cytoskeleton during cell death and it makes the apoptosis look slightly different from the canonical type because the cell is not able to detach from the, from the bottom of the cultivation chamber. Uh, in the picture, we can see uh, the image processing procedure which uh, we used. In the beginning, the, we used some uh, Gaussian, Gaussian mixture model together with some modified, modified watershed to segment and track the cells during time. Uh, only complete tracklets uh, were kept for the manual annotation. Manual, anno manual annotation was performed by me. Uh, I've used for it uh, the delay between the onset of red flu or fluorescent signal, uh, sign of the permeabilization of the membrane, um, stained by propidium iodide, and activation of, of um, execution case spaces like space three and, or seven. This, this was measured by the, some, some, some fluorescent um, product of uh, active caspases. Uh, it took me about 10 days to manually annotate the data set, uh, but then we were able to, uh, to compare the manually annotated data set with the with automatic uh, algorithm. Here you can see that uh, during the feature extraction, these two, two features were used for the classification of cell death. But what is quite interesting is that the, the prediction of the time of death was uh, much more difficult than the classification of the cell death type. Thomas has used uh, some, some kind of uh, deep learning, some lo long, long short term memory network to predict uh, the time of the cell death. Uh, and then uh, after the classification, we used some automatic classifier to get these two areas of apoptotic and uh, uh, lytic cell death in, in the dot plot. In this slide, you can compare how differs the, the curves describing the features for apoptotic cell death and lytic cell death. Please note uh, the delay between the onset of green fluorescent signal, a red fluorescent signal, which is typical for the apoptosis, because during apoptosis, the cell firstly became positive for the red, for the green signal, uh, describing the activation of caspases, and subsequently for the red signal. You can also see that the cell dynamics correct. This is the this is the Euclidean distance or the intensity change. But for the you know for the publication, we rename it to cell dynamics score, and you can see that in the case of apoptosis, it is really higher than in the case of lytic cell death. You can also see that the density is higher in the case of apoptotic cell, but this is not surprising because when the cell during apoptosis lose the contact with the extracellular matrix, uh, they became round shaped. So the amount of the mass per area is increased and also the density is increased. Here you can compare how the automatic cell death prediction fits to the manual one. 
it is not so good. You can see that the uh, accuracy it's from uh, sixty six percent to to maybe eighty eight or maybe more. I, I can see the upper part of the graph. Yeah, there's maybe eighty four percent or eighty six percent in the case of uh, the staurosporin here. But uh, note that, for example, the black phosphorus treatment. Uh, was choose because the phosphorus it's uh, not phase objects it's amplitude objects it's it means that it's not translucent for light and it makes the segmentation really difficult yeah so we wanted to make it more difficult but uh, the accuracy was was lower then here are selected uh, typical morphological uh, or typical morphotypes for canonical apoptosis uh, with a high density and uh, high cell dynamic score. You can also compare the curves describing these parameters in the graph. Uh, green one, it's uh, non-canonical apoptosis uh, with a low cell dynamic score, but with high density. And uh, the purple one, it's an ambiguous cell that which we were not able to classify. Also the automatic algorithm was not able to, to classify it. So we do not, we do not know what, what kind of cell that it was. During necrosis or during lytic cell death, the cell density and the cell dynamic score is really low. So we can really distinguish these two types of cell death according to the, according the cell dynamic score and according density. Here are the final results showing the, the distribution of the cells in the lytic cell death area and in the apoptotic area. Blue labeled cells are manually annotated lytic, lytic cells or cells dying by lytic cell death. Red labeled are, are apoptotic cells by manual annotation. And you can see that the accuracy of the automatic method is approximately 84%, which is not so bad. I don't know if you, if you, you probably have some experience with flow cytometry using annexin uh, 5 or other dyes for apoptosis detection. and I don't think it is so bad. Here you can compare um, the delay in the onset of the uh, intensity of fluorescence. You can see that during manual annotation, uh, the difference between apoptotic and necrotic cells was uh, even lower than in the case of the automatic classification. We have also used the, the assessment of the nuclear morphology using HES, HEXT staining. Uh, you know that during apoptosis, there is a shrinkage of the chromatin and also of the nucleus. So the intensity of the hex staining will increase during apoptosis. So you can compare that uh, during automatic classification, the, difference, the differences are, are more, more significant than in the case of, of manual annotation. Here, we have also used some pancaspase inhibition, uh, ZVLFMK. And you can see that after the inhibition of caspases, the amount uh, of the cells here in the upper apoptotic region was really lower than before. So uh, we proved that those cells are really apoptotic. In this short record, you can compare the micrographs with, uh, with the time lapse of the curves. You can see that the, the CDS is able to recognize the dynamic movement of the cytoplasm even before the, the blebbing, even before the dance of or oh, dense of that, how, how scientists call it. Here, you can compare it with a lytic cell that you can see that the, the cell is rounding, the cell is swelling, also the nuclei is swelling, and it all ends by the final rupture of the plasma membrane and the release of the cell content to the extracellular space. So it was lytic cell that. Finally, uh, we applied our method on the analysis of the cytotoxicity of tick-borne encephalitis virus. We analyzed uh, four populations of cells, even more, but I put only four here to, to fit in the time um, for presentation. So here you can see control group of cells, uh, which is not affected by any treatment or uh, any virus. You can see that the cells are growing. There's only limited amount of cell that and the cell are still growing in the same way. In this record, you can see uh, the virus infected cells. You can see that they 
cells will dying here by maybe some kind of irregular shape type of apoptosis, as you can see here. All right. I think it is quite apparent that it is apoptosis. Okay. Some sections. Okay. Here, those cells are also infected by the virus, by, but they are treated by the antivirotics. So you can, you can note that uh, the amount of cell that is also lower than in the case of untreated cells, only infected. So uh, we were happy because the antivirotics were working here. And uh, as some kind of control for the cell that, or, as, or as some kind of negative control for apoptosis, we induced also a lytic cell that here uh, by heating the cells, they were dying by uh, some kind of necrosis with a plasma membrane rupture and the release of the content. You can compare the cell dynamic score for the um, encephalitis virus infected cells. And you can see that uh, the volume of, of, of CDS is much higher than for the remaining treatments. And you can also see that uh, the significance differs here and only the difference between the infected cells and control is significant here. In this case, also the cell mass measurement was helpful because you can see that uh, during apoptosis, the final cell mass was lower than, than in the control cells and the lowest amount of or the lowest volume of cell dry mass was achieved after the lytic cell death when the cell membrane was, was rupturing. Okay, that's okay for me. Thank you for your attention and I'm curious for your questions. Yeah, thank you, Jan. Um, so if anyone has yeah questions, please yeah drop them in the chat. Also our, our panelists, if they have any questions, yeah, feel free to um, yeah, ask them. I think Patrick is turning his camera on. Yeah. Yeah. Jan, uh, that was a, a fun talk. Thank you. I, have, I do have a question about um, what you see as uh, as a good advantage going forward now that like using the, the classifier that you've developed uh, in phase imaging, if you can distinguish between lytic and apoptotic cell death, um, what kind of questions, what kind of new questions that allow you to address that were hard to get at before? Yeah, now, now we are trying to use this method for uh, distinction between various types of lytic cell death, you know. We are trying to specifically induce, for example, ferroptosis, pyroptosis, and necroptosis. And uh, then we, we will use some deep learning to find some typical features for these um, types of cell death. And we hope that uh, it will be um, possible to distinguish those types of cell death label free, again, like in this case. But it is difficult because uh, we face some problems with a specific uh, induction of the cell that you know because if you want to induce apoptosis you usually end with a necroptosis when you use some excitation light it usually differs it's changed the conditions and the cell will die in different ways so yeah that's where we are now cool thank you pleasure Mm, Hansa, I have a rather simple question. I like the study about antivirotics. Um, what was the temperature in the positive control? Like what temperature can cause such a damage? It's really uh, nice dying of cells. This is just yeah. one degree and they are so sensitive. It was like 45 degrees centigrade. <laughs> oh, okay. That's, that's nasty. It's really high. <laughs> okay. And then I have maybe a question for our audience, because I'm really curious who is actually sitting in the audience. Um, if the title brought here people who never heard about QPI, so they say, oh, there's something new. I've never heard QPI. Let's see what it is. Or if already fans that know the technology came here to see what more can be done with QPI. It's just something that I'm thinking of. Yeah, I think we can get to the more informal discussion part. So I'd encourage anyone to, you know, turn on your cameras and just, yeah, 
the formal part of the presentation is over. If um, anyone can share, you know, why they came here, or um, yeah, I was just gonna mention if they're already users of QPI or are thinking about getting into yeah the technology. Um, yeah, we have a comment from Elena uh, who would have liked to see the real application of QPI and the comparison with fluorescence. Um, I think Patrick's talk did feature a bit of, you know, comparing, you know, measurements of protein concentration, but I wonder if the other um, panelists can comment on, you know, um, yeah, these direct comparisons of what you can do with fluorescence based methods um, versus, yeah, QPI. Yeah, of course, uh, the comparison is like apple and oranges to me a bit, because with fluorescent you can see specific structures, specific things that in QPI will like look like the same. You cannot be sure that it's really there until you prove it as a fluorescent. So the fluorescent gives you the specificity that QPI will always like. So maybe I think that to then compare them is to see them as complementary techniques. Why is, is it good to have them both on the same microscope so you can always like decide which of them you will use? And maybe I have a related question to Jan. Mm -hmm. So you, you showed that you know graph where you had you know the, the different things like the density and, and the mass, but also the, the fluorescent signal. So I was wondering, you know, how accurately you can predict the different cell types when you have a fluorescent signal versus not, because I guess the more parameters you have, you know, the, the better your prediction is. Usually the excitation light shifts the cell that from apoptosis to, to some lytic cell that that's the mm. one common phenomenon which are, we are facing. Yeah. Mm. It's also small amounts, low intensity, low exposure, but still the shift is to our the lytic cell that. It is quite difficult to, to induce apoptosis in, in the population of cancer cells, you know. I think cancer cells are somewhat notorious for not wanting to die. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to um, second uh, Susanna's comment about um, fluorescence and, uh, and QPI as being complementary modalities. Um, I think that there is a lot of information still to be had um, from, from fluorescence, particularly if you're looking at um, something like fluorescence lifetime um, or um, uh, FCS, flu fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. I think. There is a lot of information in fluorescence that is not always accessible with a wide field microscope, but with, with some microscope. Um, and I think it's just a question of which information is going to be most informative in which context. Um, and I think for me, uh, particularly working in um, sort of in vitro biophysical material science, um, the conditions are so different inside of these protein droplets compared to where we would typically work in like a aqueous, normal aqueous solution where you typically do a calibration for a fluorescence intensity stunt or something, um, that fluorescence intensity specifically is a, not a very reliable predictor for a lot of things. And that's why the QPI is then so informative. But there are other things like if you want to look at the emission spectra of um, a fluorophore, which could be sensitive to the dielectric constant of or the local solvent polarity, that would still, I think, be really, really informative. Um, similarly, looking at, uh, again, fluorescence lifetime, um, as for a probe of, of local dynamics can still be very, very informative. So it's not that all fluorescence is bad, do QPI all the time. It's um, know what you're interested in and understanding how the way that you're measuring it, um, which things it's reliable for and which, which not. Yeah, I guess just to follow up on that, uh, I was wondering, like Susanna, you must have a lot of users who want to combine, you know, QPI with different methods. If, if you can also comment on, usually, what you know, I guess it's you know, it's, it's a range of you know different sources and methods. But what's kind of the most common request um, to combine QPI with? Um, yeah, since um, I can speak about uh, like telite case mm. uh, here more specifically. So we, the microscope that we design and produce here is uh, designed for um, live cell imaging. So mostly we deal with cell biologists, the customers and in cell biology and, and routine cultivations. Of course, the, the fluorescent is the technique that they um, ask to be, to be compatible with that. And of course, then, uh, I think the super resolution and confocal and all this like this uh, word of microscopic is also highly, highly asked. Yeah, 
Um, I haven't mentioned that uh, much in detail, the hollow tomography or Patrick mentioned tomography. Uh, that's if you want to go into uh, more detail, look inside the cells into the, the <clears throat> detailed structures. There's also one way how to approach QPI. Did you combine it with something that rotates around your sample and you get really nice resolution of, of detailed structure inside the cells. So that's a different application area of, of QPI. Also, the holotomography, again, can be again combined with uh, fluorescent also. I can ask a, a question. Do you think uh, long-term, Susanna, that there's uh, potential for uh, a confocal fluorescence add-on or version of, of the Q phase coming out of telite? But I think that the, we're glad to have wide field fluorescence, but I think for some applications, uh, the optical sectioning is, is really critical. And so then uh, having a, a pinhole would be really helpful. Oh, yeah, <laughs> so many, uh, um, every customer wants something something different or when we get the feedback from the users, when it's, oh, can you do this? So it would be nice if apart from PPI, it could do this and this and then someone else, no, I would like to have the super resolution also on there. And then there's another person coming with the wish. So the, the microscope can also make an ice cream and it's <laughs> always like finding what is the, uh, yeah, you know, we have to make a living, so what most of the people would, would want. Uh, but for example, I attended the ELMI, uh, EL, my, uh, conference just uh, recently, and uh, yeah, going super resolution and seeing more detail about the forest, and it's, it's uh, the, the trend nowadays. So maybe it will improve the, the forest and to, to higher detail. But you know, so we are startup company, so there are so many ideas that would be nice to, to be applied on Q-Phase to, to improve the microscope in so many directions, but we have to choose. Uh, no, absolutely. Yeah. Cool, thank you.